also kind, sweet, sensitive. I've heard those are words that are not often associated with the most senior academics. John Gabrielli is certainly all of those. Maybe because he started his academic career as an appreciator of great literature, majoring in English. He now uses brain imaging and research to help children with difficulty reading. In his long and impressive career, he helped the world understand how memory works by studying the famous amnesiac patient, HM. And he showed that people can actively modify their own brain activity using real-time fMRI feedback. The Grover Herman Professor of Health Sciences and Technology and Cognitive Neuroscience at MIT, please welcome John. Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this wonderful event. It's an amazing event, and it's exciting to be in a room where everybody's intellectually curious about the brain and passionate to make lives better for people. So I, I feel like I'm in an amazing audience of, uh, of colleagues to, who have these dual missions. So I want to talk to you today about um, prediction as a humanitarian and pragmatic contribution to, to, from human neuroscience. I've been studying the brain ever since I was a graduate student at MIT and came back uh, 10 years ago about. Um, and I think now is the moment, I feel more than ever, where our knowledge about the brain can be translated, can cross that valley of death into actually helping people in very practical ways. Now, I believe that animal research and fundamental neuroscience will be the revolutions, but I think faster than that, not decades from now, but a decade from now, what we can now do with brain imaging can leverage us into now helping people who need help very, very soon. And I'm very excited about that strand of research among many strands of important research. So infants are born into this world being lucky or unlucky in various ways into a neurobiological lottery where they will have genes that will make their life easier or harder. They will be born into environments that are either more supportive or more adverse. They will be born into historical epochs uh, that will influence how their genes play out. For example, I studied uh, dyslexia. The brain difference that makes it hard for 10% of children to learn to read didn't matter until humans brilliantly invented print and books and made it the centerpiece of education. Um, so all these uh, infants come into this world in this way, and then they all grow within them the fragile power of the human brain. And I'm simultaneously stunned by the capacity that, that the brain endows us with thought, feeling, opera, uh, all kinds of things. And at the same time, for every strength we have, there's a fragility, right? For every, if we can think, we can have disorders of thought. If we can have feelings, we can feel anxious or depressed. So for every amazing strength of the brain, an accompanying Achilles heel. So I'm going to tell you an anecdote followed by data. Here's the anecdote. About a year ago, uh, my daughter had to go into the emergency room with my wife. It all turned out well. But around 2 a.m., as the two of them were there, my wife came out into the hallway and saw in front of a series of examination rooms uh, security police uh, with guns, one room after another. And she asked the nurse what happened. She thought maybe there had been some shooting incident or something like that. He said they're all there on suicide watch in the children's hospital. So that's an anecdote. Here's some data. Student depression in adolescence and in young adults has doubled approximately in the last decade, doubled. And there's no reason to think it's going down. Emergency room visits for attempted suicide or suicidal ideation, so severe that a parent or, some, or an adult is bringing a child in for care into an emergency room, has gone up 100% in the last decade. Now, we can have all kinds of interesting discussions about why this is true, what are the forces in our society that make this happen this way, but these are the numbers, 100% increase in emergency room visits for children and adolescents contemplating or attempting suicide. So I'm going to feel bad saying the next thing in front of uh, colleagues who have a tremendous respect for. Okay, the revolution will be genetics and fundamental neuroscience. But if in 1985 or so, when I was getting my PhD around here, you would have said that as we stand here now, after the Human Genome Project, after fMRI, after optogenetics, after CRISPR, all of which will make an unbelievable difference, that one of these discoveries, practically, 
is touching the vast majority of lives of patients with mental health, their diagnosis or their treatment, you would have said, this person's very cynical, right? right? All this stuff, and I'm one of the people who produce a few of these papers, okay? So all this stuff, which is amazing and will make a tremendous difference, has not yet touched how a child or adult is diagnosed or treated. So how do we cross that valley of death? Um, so here's the challenge. I'm going to pick one of many, but a huge one. This crisis of mental health in our children, adolescents, and as they grow into young adulthood. And that wave will go forward as well. It won't stop. and It's just spreading into young adulthood now. So I'm going to tell you our thought about a way in which current neuroscience and technology might make a difference uh, to rescue children from this fate. So we're really interested in early identification and prevention. And I know people have used it as a slogan. Everybody is. But right now, we wait for catastrophe. We wait for the suicide attempt. We wait for the child who won't go to school because she's so anxious, the boy who can't get out of bed because he's so depressed. Right? We wait for disaster and accumulating disaster. So what could brain science do now-ish to ch maybe change that? So here's one small study, but one hopeful one maybe. So we looked at children who are pretty young, around age 10 on average. You can have depression at that age, but very few children do. Half of those children about came from families where one or both parents had a documented history of major depression. Half came from families without such a history. None of those children were depressed at the moment we saw them by any, by any careful medical interview. Put them in the MRI scanner and had them viewed uh, 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 stimuli like these showing them fearful faces, and I'll come back to fearful faces in a little bit, happy faces, neutral faces, or objects. So they were in the brain scanner, we're looking at their brain images and, and analyzing it later. And here's what we found, and I'll just tell you a very simple version of this. In the top row, you see that for happy faces, the children without a family history of depression had more activation than for fearful faces. For fearful faces, the children with a family history of depression had more response than the children without a family history. Let me rephrase this. The brains of these 10-year-olds with a risk for depression are tuned to the negative and are under-processing the positive. So life is often the proverbial glass that's half full, right, and half empty. And depending on the spirit in our brains, we can s interpret that as something good or something bad. And if you have a brain that's highly sensitive to the bad or the negative, that's a risk factor for how you see the world uh, going forward. If you have a brain that's tuned to the positive, that's a safety factor for growing up without depression or anxiety. So we see this brain difference. Um, I can tell you that our brain measures were more accurate in separating out the risk than any clinical scale that was given at the time. Um, and then we followed these children for three or four years later and asked, who goes on to develop depression and who does not? And without going into detail, I will just tell you that our brain measures in this modest sample were considerably more accurate in predicting which individual child, child by child, would go on to have depression about four years later than the clinical rating scales used by skilled academic uh, psychiatrists at MGH that we collaborate with. And one of the hot spots uh, of, of several that predicted that was this uh, red dot, uh, which is the subgenual anterior cingulate, which is if you have to pick one place in the brain, and it's not just one place for depression, but if you have to pick one, that is the most common and striking difference in adults with clinical depression. So we, we, we really think that um, uh, if we, these brain measures are outperforming at present clinical interviews and clinical scales that have been developed for many years. So if we're there, and we can get better at this, and there's a fantastic progress happening, for example, in use of uh, AI and machine learning methods to get better at this, okay? We think now we're at the moment where we could identify an eight-year-old who's at heightened risk for depression. And then what do we do about that? So I think most of us would think that we would not take an eight or nine-year-old and, and give them a medication, uh, uh, you know, hope, who don't have a problem now. But there's plenty of behavioral things we could do. So let me tell you one study that sort of melts together our interest in mental health and early education. So the amygdala, an emotion-related limbic structure, sits right in front of the hippocampus. Uh, and we did a study in Boston, in an inner city school, the children primarily low-income children, primarily uh, children from minority families. And we gave them a questionnaire asking, how stressed do you feel? How out of control does your life feel? How angry do you get because you cannot control what's going on? And what we found was this, the more stressed 
these sixth graders report they were on a day-to-day -day basis, their subjective personal feeling of stress, the more they turned on the amygdala for the negative faces. So it's a bad reciprocal system, an amygdala that turns on for the negative, and then that makes you stressed, and then you're stressed, and you see more negative things. It's a bad cycle that children are on. So what might we do about that? So uh, uh, we tried a, a mindfulness program given in the school. Children were randomly assigned, it's an RCT study, sixth graders were randomly assigned in school to either get um, a mindfulness or, and at MIT, this will be sad to say, the control condition was coding, computer coding, okay? <laughs> Which you think is not a bad thing to expose children to. And then we brought them back after the program, and here's what we found. Only the children in the mindfulness program reported reduced stress. And as a matter of fact, the greater the reduction in stress, the greater was the reduction in the amygdala response to fearful things. So we think we're seeing a brain change and a mind change uh, that's you know, applicable. And it was given to the entire class, not children at, at risk, but the entire class. And so certainly these behavioral approaches, like mindfulness or other approaches that can be given you know, uh, ethically to very young children, we think when a physician say, who's at risk? intervene early in a benign behavioral way and pull them away so that they're never sitting in that room in children's hospital with a guard outside the door hoping and preventing them from committing suicide. Thank you very much.